I'm Kelsey Moser, and you're watching Thorne's YouTube channel, where no sandbagging goes unscrutinized. We're approaching the awards time of the split in the LCS, and obviously, yes, people look to MVP. In the past, when there was more rookies, rookie of the split was a pretty cool one, the all-pro nominations, etc. But one of the ones that's always contentious, and as a result, leaves a lot of wiggle room to have discussion about, debate, healthy... Um, contrast in opinions, massive diversity in terms of who you think it should be is coach of the split because it's the most difficult role of the ones to evaluate because all the rest of player based roles where you actually see the person in the server and you have a sense of what they're doing and how they're playing and you can at least guess at some aspects. The problem is along the context of how you evaluate the players, you essentially can't evaluate the coach in that respect. You don't really know what he said, what he's done. You can look at the outcome of his team and you can judge things like what expectations did he have going in? Who did you think that player was before they worked with this coach? Did you see improvement from certain weeks to another that look as though he had impact? So there's a lot of spec speculation, a lot of guesswork, but I do think it has some value as an award. I think you should try and recognize people who've accomplished something. I know there's been a few cases back in the day that were a little bit egregious in terms of who won, but generally I think it's a pretty reasonable thing to have. I also think as a result, someone needs to win it, so make your case. So in my case, I'm going to make the case that Weldon Green, head coach of CLG, Counter Logic Gaming, is the coach of the split. So as I said before, the key word expectations like you look at this roster look at the roster he inherited when he came along early this year so in spring he had darshan top wiggly in the jungle power of evil in mid sticks in biofrost as his bot lane so darshan is an absolute bust there's a reason he's not even playing in the league right now on the lcs level he wasn't particularly good last year quite frankly it's been many years since he's been that great carry solid carry top laner or even the flexible guy who could just go all around the champion pool and therefore have great value in that sense seemed to have lost i mean he still had the mentality to try and carry he just couldn't do it couldn't execute on it so they had to have darshan top because they didn't want to splurge out and get flame who was available they considered too much money the clg orgs didn't didn't go along with it and when you consider how key the solo lane has been all year long but including in the spring having to play certain picks early when it was just like the scion aatrox period then going into when obviously now you had this massive amount of champions when you got later on you needed that role, and CLG traditionally has often been a team that ganks to top. So it was always going to be tough to have a team with Darshan in it. Then you go look elsewhere. That's the weakest player. Then you had Wiggly. Okay, seemed like a guy with some talent coming up from Challenger, but unproven. And you know what? You saw some games he struggled when he was in split in spring, rather. He even got benched for three games overall, or didn't didn't play three games. Like two, he was benched for when it was like it was implied it was behavioural issues or something that had happened that the coaching staff didn't like, and this was something of a punishment or something to offset what had happened and try and bring them back online. Well, if you followed the history of LCS. You've seen so many hyped jungle prospects coming into the LCS that everyone says play aggressive and are going to take over the game and could shot call and be proactive. And they either don't make it or they have a couple of good games, half a split that's good. They fall away, diminishing returns just because it's a position you can't have five imports in your team. They get chances in other teams and they never make it. I mean, TSM themselves have collected a nice fucking roster of those players over the years themselves. Then you go, now we're starting to get to the more established players. So Power of Evil, I've always thought, is a good player. He will always be an above average player at mid lane in LCS or LEC. He came from the Optic team, which is a little bit flawed, but even then he had games that were pretty good. I think coming into this year, he was clearly supposed to be the best player in the team on paper. But the thing about him is, much like my boy Froggen, you have to know how to play around him. He's not a guy you just chuck in there, give any meta champion, and then say, right, I'm going to build this uh, comp that I think is just the global meta comp that's the best. You have to know how to use him. You have to suit his comfort, fit his strengths, actually put the style of the team around how he wants to play, his laning style, farm style, control mage approach. Like, you need to really know what you're doing if you want to bring the best out of him. You saw when he was in Origin, and they didn't have the right support network, and they were all vets and thought they could just play other stuff. Yeah, well, it wasn't a really great setup overall. Then you have, and also I'll say, I don't actually think generally Power Evil has, like, the, the mindset in terms of his confidence, his self um, perception. I don't see him as someone who has like the killer instinct in the same way a lot of the really great EU mids do. So that's also an area where I think he's a little bit trickier to coach potentially. I think he's a guy who can get down on himself, can lose confidence, or when he's going through a slump, unlike some of the other great players, 
doesn't necessarily have the same way to will himself out of it, as it were, or to ignore that block it out and keep playing great. Then you've got the bottom lane that they obviously brought over for many years now, which is, well, not many years, it's a couple. It's Stixie and Biofrost at this point in time. Clearly a solid bot lane. Personally, I think they've actually always been quite overrated, though. Because they're solid, because they're either average or at times above average in L LCS, people, just like a Apollo and Hakuo, because then it makes people feel like they're underrated, because they're not a killer bot lane, then you get into scenarios where, because everyone says they're underrated, well, if you've ever followed Macare, you know, when everyone says you're underrated, you actually inevitably end up probably getting and overrated because it just becomes a narrative and a meme it gains enough inertia and steam itself and eventually it overtakes and now you become slightly overrated so as a result yeah okay good bot lane but it's the kind of bot lane i want where i'm going to play through mid and top i'm going to play through my solos so if you look at the setup of this team pue is not the guy who you just put on anything and hard carry 1v9 the bot lane's solid, but it's not necessarily the best lane. If you try to only play through bot lane, you're not going to win LCS. And then your top lane in Darshan is an absolute bust. And it's an unproven X factor could completely go one way or the other player at jungle who's brand new to the scene. And actually, you're going to put some shot calling burdens on. This is not a roster that every coach coming in LCS could succeed with or do anything with, quite frankly. I think if you take most of the coaches right now in the LCS... Obviously, this is pure speculation on my part and based on a, a little few things I know from behind the scenes about coaching staffs and their philosophies and how they've worked. I personally think in the league right now, there might only be two or three coaches that could actually coach this type of a lineup and get anywhere close to the results Weldon actually has. So I think that's pretty big time stuff. And I actually even think there might even be superstar coaches at the top level who might not be as good because I don't think they'd have the same skill set to work with these lesser players. You saw when Kane worked with the shit team Liquid. Yeah, it wasn't that great, right? Put him with superstars. He's phenomenal. Now, I don't know how Weldon would be with the superstars as head coach, but he's done a great job with this icon. So like mixed fair roster. Like I think if you look at this lineup for spring on paper, I would say they probably should have been like, eighth or ninth maybe even a team that could finish last place when you consider some of the other teams out there i would have put maybe them above like echo fox or something then you come and you consider that even in spring don't just look at the final result this was already a solid team like it had ups and downs it wasn't necessarily super consistent but it was solid it could get wins off a lot of teams they could absolutely have made spring playoffs unfortunately that week where for disciplinary actions as far as i can tell they sobbed out some of the players they lost those games and that cost them the playoff spot in the end they would have actually been a team heavily contending or directly in the playoffs then they bring in Ruin. Well, that isn't an established top player, someone who's definitely going to do really well. We've seen a lot of Korean imports fail who are very good players who come into LCS. Why would this guy succeed? Well, it's worked out pretty well so far. They've certainly, uh, here's another thing, accommodated him. They gank for him. They give him resources. Sometimes they allow him to die and seemingly go off when he needs to. I mean, it seems a bit disconnected at times. But they play through him when he has his strengths and allow him to have carry games. What's interesting for me about this squad, even when you brought in Ruin, is... Even at the end of the split, I look at them and I don't actually consider anyone on this squad a real legitimate MVP candidate. I don't think they actually have a superstar player. Like Wiggly's looked pretty good for an up-and-coming jungler, but his style, I think, actually is something where he transfers the leads he gets to the team. So he's not like a guy who's going to 1v9 hard carry from jungle in that sense. Then you go look at Power of Evil. I think he's the best player on the team, but you look at him, like I said, he's got his own issues. He's very strong in certain regards, but you know, it, it somewhat paints you into an area where you've got to play a certain way around him if you want to get the best out of him. So I don't know who the superstar player is on this team. I would say there isn't one. And so if you look at them, considering they are a top three team in the league, Every other team has multiple superstars, people who at times have been the best at their position. I don't think CLG has a single player who is the best at their position. I don't even think it's that close overall. Like for me, Svenskeren overall was a better jungler than Wiggly in most regards. He didn't play as many games, but that's about the only debatable one. Like PoE is definitely not the best mid. The bot lane is definitely not the best bot lane in any regard. They even had some games where... Like I've seen some games where Bio did int sometimes, where Stixie had that Ezreal game. Was it? Was that one against C9, the one we just didn't hit a bloody skill shot the whole game long? Like these are solid players, but they're by no means top fair. Well, everyone talks when Team Liquid is top of the league, gets their seeds every time. Well, they've got all the best players. C9, oh, every player's good at their position. A bunch of them have got experience, and they've got all these talented rookies. What's CLG working with? So again, I'm going to speculate this coach, Walden Green, had a lot to do with this. Then you go and look at the fact that. Because they don't have an MVP level player, they absolutely do it as a team. And they found strength, different strengths, and offset the weaknesses in all areas of their roster. That's, for me, an example of good coaching. Because what it means is you've assessed and realistically done it. 
your personnel, and then you figure out what their strengths and weaknesses are, how to cover some weaknesses, how to emphasize the strengths, and in this case, not make it too obvious how you play through an aspect, and in fact, you probably can't just play through one lane all the time, you have to move around. So you look at the results in terms of expectations, the CLG org right now is in no position to think they can be the best. Even to make top four, with the roster they've put together, with the resources they look as though they've allocated, top four is unreasonable expectation, I think, to put on a coach and put on this lineup. So when you consider they've already finished top four, this split, they could absolutely go to the final. I don't know that I'd expect much more myself. Like, I think they have a crack at beating C9, but C9 did look good in some of the games they won against them. I don't really think they can win, but that's neither here nor there. To be fair, it helps them that at the moment in C9, aside from Niski, who I think Percy's contentious, and Sven Skeren, the rest of the team also have had moments that they've had issues this split, and so maybe that can even out a little bit. But it's the playoffs, superstars tend to take over. That's where I see kind of a problem for them. This is a team, remember though, that almost got a top two seed and a direct buy into the semis. This is a, the league that has Cloud9, Team Liquid, TSM, bigger orgs, bigger talents, more money spent. Like, this is a, an example of a team that I think is way above and uh, exceeded expectations, has gone above and beyond what you should actually think is reasonable for them to have done. Then you look how they play the game. So first of all, they've got pretty nice macro. And this is a league, remember, where GGS has already shown you, you can actually be a team beating the best teams and making playoffs, almost did it this way, with seemingly no real sense of macro in mid-game. Then you go on the other side of the equation, when Under Thieves bring in Amazing and get Afro move vaguely back on side and bring in players that they at least can use as placeholders that can do something, like Ryu, well, or, or even Fake God, well, guess what? Even without good players, by having some decent macro and some decent shot calling, especially late in the game, they're winning a whole bunch of games and they're in position themselves. These are two teams that almost made playoffs. One doesn't have macro, one only has macro, seemingly. And these teams were playoff teams. So in a league like that, for CLG, especially with some parts that aren't superstar parts and some parts that I haven't even played together, haven't played in the league before, to actually get them to where they are now, that's a big improvement in my book. Then you consider not only do they have solid macro, they can team fight, they can close games out fairly cleanly, this team can actually split push, this team can actually 1-3-1. You know how many fucking times I watch LCS and I see teams with the, the right comp for it, the right draft, the right players, and they don't do it because they don't want to do it. They think it's too hard to execute. Well, if you heard when Weldon came on Listen Local, he basically implied that that's like one of the key ways he wants the game to play. He wants them to do what you've seen them do this split. Remember, he came on in the spring. He wants them to be a team that can 1-3-1 and can push and pull you from lane to lane as you just slowly saw down the, the, the turrets and the inhibs and then all of a sudden you're in an even better position to win before you've had to have the proper fight. That's hard to execute, especially at LCS, but you look, Weldon's a guy who worked with G2, it seemed like very much knew what they were doing in that respect a few seasons back when they had their own bot lane that was very, very stable. So I think it's interesting, I, I have to guess some of that comes from him. Now true, he has this guy, Irian, who's apparently some like high ELO solo queue player and has his own history coaching. Maybe that guy also helps with it, but you look, listen, listen to the way Weldon talks and his philosophy, it makes sense, I think, overall. Then you look their game planning. So when they come into a game, do they have a set plan? Do they have win conditions? Do they have an understanding of what their comp is, what the opposing team's comp is, how they should play, how the opposing team should play? They certainly seem like it. Like, even when they weren't a great team this year, they would not get leads at times. It's just they couldn't do much beyond that. Now, they get leads. They're fairly strong in terms of macro. They have a multiple styles that they can play. They can, in theory, go through all the lanes on the map. They're not going to go through some of them as much. Then you consider... The shot call looks fucking good, but who's doing it? Well, based on the things I'd read and heard, Wiggly did most of it early. Apparently, Stixay does some of it late. Makes sense. He's AD carry, right? That's, to me, again, you're, you're creating a proper comms system. You're distributing who does the shot calling. You're empowering a, a guy who's basically still sort of a rookie to be a shot caller over a bunch of veterans and even people who've won championships. And then late game, you're giving the guy who himself can have big agency, his own chance to do it. And you, you're splitting up. You're not making one person carry all the burden. You're not saying everyone does it. You, you're dividing it up depending on who it makes sense for and at what time in the game. So this to me, again, looks like a systems-based approach. That to me aligns with Weldon's career philosophy. To me, he's the guy who I would speculate when he coaches, it's more about the principle he's coaching than the specific example. It's not that you did this wrong. It's that you did this wrong because here's the principle I want you to remember. Because when you can inculcate those principles 
They can make their own decisions in that moment. They don't have to remember 7,000 examples of, well, when I'm there and someone's there and he tries this and that. No, you know the overall principle of what I was trying to accomplish, what he was trying to do, what the gist of it is, what the essence of it. I see that as, as a Weldon way of thinking if you listen to a, enough of his vlogs and seen enough of his interviews. And as I say, they can play pretty much in theory through all the lanes and they do it if necessary. So you look at Weldon's coaching strengths. I said when he joined the team, I thought this might be a good team for him to join because he's coming from a psychology background. Well, look at the players they have, right? Ruins Korean and doesn't have very much experience playing at the top level. So you're going to have to be very, very careful how you handle him, what you do with him, how you communicate with him, what tasks you give him, not overburden him. Wiggly's brand new and has already had some issues in the spring, which seemingly they've worked through because he looked like a new player in the summer, much, much better player, contender for one of the best junglers in NA. Power of Evil, as I suggested before, he's a bit of a quieter guy. He's not really like a forthright guy. He's not a firebrand mid laner in any sense or someone who's going to demand things. Then their bot lane is also a bunch of quiet personalities. People are a little bit more reserved. So you look at this squad. They're a squad that would need leadership from somewhere. We need a bit of development to bring them out of their shells. I don't think they have a natural leader or someone, a veteran on the team who'll do that necessarily. I would guess Weldon and his coaching staff have done a great job here. Then I actually consider Weldon's biggest strength communication. I mean, the joke there would be in the past when I thought he overvalued himself. The, the joke with that was, well, the great job he was doing was what you were hearing. It was it was the sales pitch. Whether or not he could then deliver after that, I mean, he's very mixed up results. Everyone remembers the ops. They don't mention the downs, I noticed. So I'll just say, I've always thought communication must be good because that means that he's framing things in a way that makes sense to you and create the atmosphere that you want. He is able to de-escalate so that you notice when he has these conversations on public shows, there aren't arguments, there aren't people going crazy and being wild at each other. Even if separately he might make inflammatory comments, he always gets along with the people he's talking to because he he understands communication, he knows what types of words to choose, how to shift your tone, how to take the energy out of the scenario when it's getting a little bit contentious. And crucially, this is one of the reasons why even at times when I haven't rated him personally, I thought definitely he's good at this. He connects with people. He makes people believe that they share a vision, that he's communicated his ideas to them, that they can trust him, that he's going to do what he says he can do. These are all big aspects which you then take and apply to essentially a team with a mixture of quieter players, inexperienced players, even a rookie element. This is a scenario, and then mixed nationalities even. This is a scenario where I could see all these strengths fitting big time. And there's many, many coaches, most coaches in the league, lack some of those communication and psychology strengths that actually Weldon seems to have in spades. Then you look at the whole aspect where he clearly is willing to delegate and give credit elsewhere. This is a guy where he, he talks up the Irian guy about how good he is and how he can be better than his own players in solo queue. He seems like someone with his communication system approach and his past as a psychology trainer who I imagine listens to his players and tries to take on board their concerns and their weaknesses and their problems. And obviously people know this is one of the reasons in terms of connecting and listening to players and making them feel heard. This is one of the reasons why there are certain great players he's worked with who do rave about him and, and say very nice things about him and say he helped them get over things. So how valuable that would be in this type of a personnel situation. So for me, nobody did more with less in the LCS this split. Now, that isn't the only criteria for being MVP. Like I hit oh, coaching the split in this case. I hate when they do that for MVP and they make it like, well, he's the best player on a team that's quite bad, but he got quite high up. It's like, that sort of works as a weird maths equation. But at the end of the day, if Core JJ is just the best player and had a load of amazing games, he's the MVP. I don't care that he's on Team Liquid. Similarly, if Kane's the best coach and he has the best players, but he also wins the league and is dominant, then he's the best coach. Like, but in this case, for Weldon specifically, this goes heavily in his favour. The expectations, the roster, what they've since shown, the massive development and the all-around game they've shown, so in, in some cases, without the superstar names and players, without the talent, that's easy to say, well, they've got all the best players. I think if you look at Kane and you look at Reaper, they're classic picks for this award as well. And I wouldn't be that mad if they won it either. But personally, for me, I'll take Weldon for a coach of the split this time. This video was kindly supported by Patrick Ribeiro, Penguin Off9, Dean Tanglis, Andreas Snazor Westerland, Fat Guy Got 24 ADR in an Online Qualifier, Lee Chow Lan, Blunt Smoking Anus Destroyer, J Dobbs, Ho Chi Mao, Tobias Bernasconi, Nate DOGG, Alexander Rao, Collier G, and as always, special thanks goes out to Jerky's Minion. Now, do you want to suggest a topic or a guest for some of my content? Obviously, I have quite a varied output. Do you want to ask me a question for my monthly video AMA? Maybe you want teasers, see who the guests are on my next shows. Do you want to take part in a donator discussion with me about esports? Well, if so, put your money where your mouth is. Join the Skrilluminati today in the description box below. There's a Patreon link.